Welcome to the Delish Guestless Podcast, a deep dive into the lives and work of Hong Kong's crazy food and beverage industry leaders, hosted by the Beat Asia magazine. This episode, we speak with Hong Kong's very own Mei Chow, chef and owner of the Little Bao Empire in the city, operating her acclaimed restaurant chain since 2013, where we sat down with Mei at her Causeway Bay joint after the lunch hour rush. Mei Chow champions Neo-Cantonese fusion cooking and female and LGBT empowerment in the kitchen. We spoke to her about her success behind one of Hong Kong's more symbolic restaurants and what Cantonese food culture means for her. Enjoy! Hello listeners in Hong Kong, Asia and beyond. We are speaking today with Chef Mei Chow of the eminent Little Bao restaurant franchise a defined name brand in the city's F&B scene, blending the foundations of Cantonese cuisine with influences from abroad. Arriving in the city in 2009, May's culinary CV reaches all corners of Michelin and local international acclaims. Having worked with Alvin Long at Bo Innovation, Craig Vin Dang at the former TBLS, and Matt Abigail at Yardbird, her signature bao buns made their first appearance at the Island East Market, in Taiku in 2012, before her first Little Bao opened in 2013 in Soho. May, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Thank you for recapping my life. Absolutely. How does that sound? Pretty good. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> um, born to a Chinese Hong Kong family in Toronto, um, why did food have uh, such a pull that you're here right now sitting down with us to, to flick back on that story, that massive... Uh, CV that you have, the um, the I, name that you possess. I think everything's hindsight 2020. So in reflection, um, I grew up in a uh, very loving family. My mom was always a, what we call Tai Tai. Like she was a housewife. She didn't have a career, but she was Shanghainese, very outspoken, and she loved cooking. And so I think being very close with her, um, seeing her cook and you know, she used to hit me when we played piano, but she didn't hit me when we, you know, made food. So, you know, naturally a kid wants to be good at something they're, you know, commended on. And, and it was something she did with me very lovingly. And, and it was now I know that it was passed through generations from her mother to her to me. So I can see why that passion was inherent. And then, of course, when I was young, to be honest, I actually had ADHD. And so... For many, many years in Hong Kong, uh, from schooling, people, I thought I was not very smart. I thought um, there was something, you know, that I wasn't applying in school. And eventually I figured out, you know, um, my calling through food, but also my sense of learning. I like really tactile things and I learned, I like learning through experience. And so all those things really applied well through the F&B industry. And it was very personal and, and that kind of, energy that's inherent within restaurants and food is just very exciting. Was there a reason coming to to Hong Kong in 2009? I mean, I came in 2009 as well for a a reconnection of this sort of Cantonese identity. Was that sort of a search that you were on as well? Uh, It wasn't that uh, early on that time was literally either I could have married my gay best friend and stayed in the U.S. or moved back to Hong Kong. So it was not... I could not get a visa in the U.S. <laughs> and then I came back to Hong Kong. And it was also a time where, you know, um, um, I haven't been with my family for a long time. So it felt like a good time to reconnect as well. Sure, 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 sure. sure. Was there any doubt that you wanted to work in restaurants in, uh, in Hong Kong? Actually, Hong Kong gave me the opportunity to. Because when I graduated from college, you know, Um, It wasn't actually that easy to get a career in food in U.S. Plus, you know, I I was on a student visa, and so it wasn't easy. When I came back to Hong Kong, I had the privilege of living at home and not having to pay rent, which allowed me to be like, I really want to try. Like, I couldn't, Mm. like, I worked at hotels and I worked at catering companies, but as, like, you know, kind of more admin or office type of job, and I just, I just didn't enjoy it at all. And so the only thing that I could think that I could do was being in a restaurant. So I thought, I have to try. And so that was around, I don't remember how old I was, maybe 22, 23, after, right after college. 
So it doesn't date back really deep, I guess, professionally in jobs that were in your childhood, adulthood. It really started as sort of a way to occupy yourself. It's in interesting because in, I think... I wanted to go to cooking school when I was a kid, but my parents were like, you're going to college. So I went to college and then I graduated from college and I, I tried to do the normal trajectory and uh, I just couldn't. So, so I think after I, you know, did a few years, I just, I was ready to dive into FMB. So living under your parents' home and not paying rent, but looking forward to a career post-university, do you think it was hard to convince your parents that, this is something that I can do, uh, this career? Sometimes people fail not because of, because parents were support or not supportive. Their way of supporting was very interesting, was to give you options when you're really tired. Meaning like, hey, May, like, I'll be like exhausted coming home at 2 a.m. They're like, hey, May, if you want to stay home and not work, we can take care of you and you find another job. And I'll be like, oh, shut up. Like, I just need to sleep <laughs> and get over with. Because yeah. they really wanted me to quit. They wanted me to think about a better option. And do and, what? But there was a lot of truth, like, to be honest. Mm. Like, even when I mentor young girls or young chefs now, the reality is that we fell in love with the... We didn't, you know, look at other restaurants and go to Chinese restaurants or go to, you know, restaurants that we went to as a kid and be like, I want to be that guy. You know what I mean? I watched Yang Can Cook on TV. Netflix came really? along, you know, and Lee Bourdain. It was a whole sexy, media-driven idea about what a chef is. No one thought like, oh, my God, my life career would just be working 16 hours a day, Absolutely. seven days Absolutely. a week, yeah. doing the th same thing over and over and over again. Were you scared of, because uh, you mentioned Anthony Bourdain, the idea that food is not just food. It's the, it's the adventure. It's the exploration of society and culture. Did you feel attracted to what food represents rather than what genuinely it is, building a community? I think what it really is, is what the job entails. And what we all aspire to is what that 1% is doing. Really? So I am lucky that I'm in that 1%. So I can create food all the time. I can communicate food. I can talk about the philosophy of food. You know, all the, the diasporas of Chinese cuisine. But to be real, like the, the day to day job is making the same thing one menu for one year, two years, 10 years. Yeah. And now I see it actually interesting. If you want to get a three Michelin star, I see it like almost like running for the Olympics. You can't do it for 50 years. Like you could, but you could like, you know, look like, like Gordon Ramsay with like lots of, you know, look like you're, you know, you just dried out for 30 years. You know what I mean? Like you could and like, you know, lose a liver or two. <laughs> but the reality is that if you see it as you have to start young, you have to commit 16 hour days, six days a week. And you just chase it. Really? You chase it for about a decade, 15 years, 20 years, until you get three stars. And so you see someone like Marco Pierre White, maintaining three stars is horrific. It's like playing defense for eight years, but you're like, you know, You don't every want to get day. wrinkles on your ears. And it's different because once it's proven successful, you can't change anything. Really? So you maintain the same menu for another eight years. And then he retired. So it's Jeez. like, this is enough. And so if you can see it that way, then actually it's more purposeful because you're not like, I'm going to have three Michelin stars for the rest of my life. I'll have it for 10 years. It's like you can have three Olympic golds. You're lucky if you have five. And then that's it. And then move on, like move on to something else. So when you entered F&B and you had this idea, like, I don't want to do the three Michelin stars, what was the, the goal that you had? You didn't have a goal. No, I didn't have a goal. Usually people who are this romantic or this passionate are not that logical. So, and also I was a creative and I realized that creative uh, people all have horizontal careers. Like they were never like, they're like, did you climb the ladder? I was like, I did not even think I was climbing the ladder. I was just like, oh yeah, he cooks so well. Let me follow him. Let's go to this restaurant. Let's go to that restaurant. So I was lucky enough, but I think inherently I wanted to be an entrepreneur beyond just being the title of wanting to be a chef. Sure, 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 I wanted sure. to be an entrepreneur. So very early on, I, I literally wrote you know, uh, a diary of Alvin Lang. And every time he did something that I didn't agree with, I write down like, when I become boss, I won't be like this, you know? <laughs> Was it interesting or captivating to work with him? Everyone's successful for a reason. Mm. And he was highly successful. He, I can understand on many levels why he was really important. He 
he ate really well himself. He wasn't professionally trained, so I wouldn't say that you would learn from him in terms of technical skills as a chef, but how he presented himself, how he knew where the market was driving, how he could get three Michelin stars or get to that level. I think he had a clear idea of what that meant so, so, so. and how to, you know, when, when, because you have to understand that year or that time, no one ever done that in Hong Kong before. And he was the first hometown hero, like really? someone that was at that caliber, but also to be that internationally renowned, like everyone knew him do across you think the world. You, do you think you followed his footsteps in flipping Cantonese cuisine on some head, on looking at specific, I guess, tenets of traditional fare that you'd find in Hong Kong and putting a twist on it? I think he definitely gave me the taste of what it meant. I, I share to creatives all the time. Mm. If you're serving a local community, you're hyper international. If you're so serving an international community, you're hyper localized. Because huh. the reality is, like, if you want to have representation in the world of what you're representing for Hong Kong, you need to be representing the city, the ingredients, the story, everything. You're the hometown hero for the world. Absolutely. There's a huge difference. Like, I always say, like, if you're Bruce Lee, you're, you were promoting Kung Fu to everybody. You weren't just doing it for the Hong Kong audience. And so knowing that, like, my goal was to be international. I wanted to be iconic in the whole FMB community. More than a decade ago, this was your goal. Yeah, like, I, I, we were writing, you know, business plans, and, wow. and, 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 and my friend was writing for me, but still clueless. But he, she's like, oh, you're going to be the hometown hero. And I was like, what do you mm. mean? She's like, because everyone else is international. Everyone's doing international cuisine. No one's talking about Hong Kong. And so if anyone wants to know more about Hong Kong, they'll come to you. So do you think that you've accrued this international name for yourself because you've taken the bao and made it into a burger and brought these different ingredients, these different cuisines, fusioned that together that has brought the local through to the international? I think that's like, I don't think it's so of hindsight, not that moment. Mm. If I had to hindsight look at it, it's like being a, like what we're achieving now is that 0.1%. So it's like sure. me telling you, I'm not saying I'm Dua Lipa, but like, can you really follow Dua Lipa's footsteps and achieve the same success? If she was a brain surgeon, you could follow exactly the same steps and become Absolutely. a brain surgeon. Right? So it means like it's a lot of luck, a lot of society, uh, what the world was trending. I was the first restaurant probably in Hong Kong that was taking something very local but international and in a very small space. It was when Instagram just started. Damn. We became viral without any strategy to become viral. No marketing. Uh, I picked green tea as an ice cream sandwich because I was too lazy really? to make a, 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 a real dessert. So my, my dessert pastry uh, friend was like, just fry the bun and stuff some ice cream inside. She's like, why do you have to make a chocolate cake? Who cares? Just stuff it. I was like, that seems kind of lazy. No? Yeah. And then I picked green tea. And it's interesting. We were number one on open rice. And I was like, why are we number one on open Seriously? rice? Seriously. Because number one was green tea ice cream sandwich. Number two was green tea latte. Number three was green tea souffle. Wow. And I was like, I did not. And I was like, what if I picked chocolate? Yeah. You know? And then why would my mind pick green tea? Because I thought... Everyone in Hong Kong likes green tea. Pick green tea. But I didn't know the impact of what that meant in, in, in how to create that. So you can only see in hindsight 2020. Do you think this hindsight 2020, I think we're in this space right now in Little Bao in Corzo Bay as compared to the first Soho, um, former Soho home, and then now the second Soho home. Are you playing or have you inadvertently played to the tastes and I guess flavors of Hong Kong foodies, people that eat in Hong Kong? Instagrammable bites, cute looking appearances of the food as well. Something that's very consumable. I guess not using quite challenging uh, recipes. I think, no, I think it's when we wanted to do it. I, at this point, I went to Bonovation. Mm -hmm. Bonovation showed me, like, we went to Sydney Food and Wine Festival. He took me to Singapore. He, wow. every time I went abroad, they're like, oh my God, is he the demon chef from like, parts unknown and and so i knew the power of sure. what storytelling was sure, sure, sure. and then but when i went to matt at yardbird and he that year when i was working with him he broke every paradigm everything he was i wanted to be he had the sense of community mm. 
every brand, every touch point was a reflection of his personality and what he believed in. He was an honestly genuine, like great boss, and everyone respected him. And the people who came were just cool. So, so we were like, and he was the first person where I was like, I want to be like him. Because when I was with the Alvin and uh, Quay, I was like, oh yeah, whatever. Like, there's some parts I appreciate about them, but there were I couldn't see myself like them. So Matt was the first person. He was a great mentor. Mm, mm. When I when, even when we before we went into execution, he's like, your branding sucks. Like, you need to rebrand. Like, this is no good. And he's like, oh, this idea is not original enough. Do better. And so I think really? that's like him being honest with me. And he found me actually my first location because it was so hard oh, to wow. find even a shop. then. so if you ask me now and then, like our proudest moment then was to kind of distill what I learned, but try to find something that was honest. And I think, you know, what I loved about Little Bao was that we were social. I loved to party, so music, drinks, like the atmosphere, I think. And the food itself was a culmination of my random life experiences, like, you know, from rave to Coachella to whatever. And, and then also bringing that community together. So sure. I think that was great. And then being able to then take that item and I thought, we must make it so that my grandma doesn't think it's for white people but white people don't think it's too Chinese <laughs> and we're trying to ride the line. And it's actually really hard because you can do fusion in New York. I'm serving 50% local customers mm. and the bao is about 10 times more expensive than the Anatasio bao. A gua bao. Like gua bao, any yeah. bao. And, and actually even all the gua baos that open that were kind of gimmicky or whatnot, they've all closed. So our proudest moment now is like, we've been around for a decade. That's like dog years. Like, you know, restaurant Jesus. years and then passing through protests yeah. COVID and then still surviving it's beyond like my proudest moment is like how do we become timeless so, so my goal is like I need to stick it through for 20 years and wow. then it's not even like do you like it or not it's like if you call it Hong Kong and you don't eat at that you know tomato you soup you know yeah. beef noodle place on that corner <laughs> you're not local like I'm trying to get there you know wow I mean it's, it's a it's a unbelievable success story just hearing that number 10 coming through uh, my headphones and knowing that uh, leases last three years in Hong Kong and yeah. then some other concept comes in. Do you think in the beginning you always wanted to do East meets West and do you think that was the way that you captured both sides of Hong Kong? I always knew. Um, there's a lot of things that go through my head. Sure. Um, I wanted it to reflect the culture because that was also like that was what was expected because, you know, even when I, I read a lot about successful chefs and businesses, Sometimes a community drives you. We were taught the first uh, Noma interview. The guy was like, you know, he was sitting down, he was talking about his food, and then the, the, the reporter asked him, what are you doing for sustainability? Mm. So then he's like, oh, I don't know, like nothing. So, but then you're embarrassed, so you go home and you're like, why am I not? But how many people ask you? Like every day, everyone asks me, Absolutely. what are you doing for Hong Kong? What are you doing for women empowerment? What are you doing for LGBTQ? What are you doing for sustainability? And how are you driving the direction? So it, it sets really big goals. It's kind of cool. It's a lot of responsibility, but I find that right quite um, fun. And so for me to say that for food, for me, money is not the ultimate goal. But Hong Kong, you need to be financially savvy in order to survive. So if you don't know how your staff is getting paid or mm. what's going on, you can't survive here. So you cannot purely be creative. Because you have to withstand a lot in order to get even get there where the point you get to be creative, right? Absolutely. And then two is like, you know, you, it's, you, I was very worried about being a one-hit wonder. And so by the time I was very trending very hard, I was already ready to progress. Like, oh, I can't be a hipster and be hype beast all my life. Mm. Clearly, there's an age group for this. And so then I already was like in Women's Foundation. I was doing corporate you know, a lot of initiatives and, and talking about bigger purposes for the brand and myself included. That was beyond just, are you the most trending number one thing? So I guess yeah. in 2022 as well, you have initiated a lot of pop-ups with um, big names or very foundational restaurants in Hong Kong that are trending right now. Is that a way that you keep Little Bao fresh and you innovate on the one product that is the Bao? Well, I'm a big fan of Jane Fonda and talking about Richard Ekebis. It's like, you need to know at one point, either you're 
the young kid that's fresh or you're mentoring someone that's fresh or you're partnering with someone that's fresh. And mm-hmm. to feel energetic is that, you know, I can, I don't care if they're 20 or 30 or famous or not. It's to trigger you to want to grow all the time. So for me, it's like we do partnerships where anything that intrigues me, like could be. So right now we're doing one with a retired 70 year old uh, Citron master chef and he's coming and uh, he's retired. And I met him at this random wow. event and he's done Citron for food for 50 years. Wow. And he's doing a pop-up here. So I don't know if that attracts 20 year olds or not, but it piques my interest. Absolutely. You know what I mean, Absolutely. it's freaking cool. And someone like Richard or, and my whole idea is that we're trying to tell a story where like Zara or whatnot, like there's Carl Lagerfeld that does a collab with Zara and everyone can buy it. So I told them like, Richard, not everyone can spend $1,800 to have your meal, but for 78, 138, it's an affordable luxury that they can understand more about you and your life and your achievements and your philosophy about food in this little dainty little bow. So that's what our mission was when we started that partnership. So essentially you can fit any cuisine, any concept, any pop-up, any collaboration in between those bonds. Yeah. And so we like to think that this fluffy bond is non-invasive. We can talk about woman empowerment in this fluffy bond. Mm. We can talk about LGBT. Like, ha ha, like, you know, like you should do better in a bond, you know, (laughs) that kind of vibe. So I always thought it was really fun because... Even when we were doing our first concept, um, it was about when we served this bun, maybe you don't, you can't accept citron hot pot yet because there's floating chilies. It's, it's like chicken with bones in it, with the head, da da. But you can eat it inside a burger. Sure. And I can tell you about the hot pot and I tell you about the culture. So it's a perfect vehicle for introducing yeah. West, yeah. Western mouths for Eastern food. And Eastern Anything. miles for Western food. And I think what it is, is like, what, what is that purpose of that? And I love this restaurateur, Alan Yao from London. And he said, someone asked him, like, is interior design important for food business? He's like, uh, not really. It's the bottom line in operations. But really, if it, I can't even have design, like, why am I doing this? It's not even creative at all. Really? You know what I mean? Because you're just slapping noodles and doing operations. <laughs> and it becomes an operations job. <laughs> So I find a lot of meaning in my work because I create meaning within it. If not, sure. we're just serving bows all day. Sure, sure, sure. With four flavors and two ice cream sandwiches <laughs> and four cocktails, right? And so it makes the the job more fun and more yeah. interesting and more meaningful to me. And and those actions, like whether they're strategic for the long term, I just you know I enjoy mm. pursuing it in that that way. So I guess you mentioned uh, filling the buns with women empowerment. Those topics, women empowerment and LGBT education. Has that been something at the forefront throughout uh, with Hong Kong that has a lot of white male chefs involved in restaurant businesses? And to I be different, I think it's is- white male or white or male anything. I was just at a. Mm. Uh, I, I'm always invited to these panel discussions, and the little mom guy may like it's a it's a it's a financial tech and finance, and they're like, "You're the only woman on the panel." I'm like, "Come on, like, can you find someone in your industry?" Yes. But you're finding someone in food <laughs> to be the only woman on the panel. And uh, I was watching this show on, I love this show called Hacks. I don't know if it's like two stand-up comedians, amazing show. And I, re- I realized for me to push certain initiatives, I sometimes do stand-up comedy. Like it's like, ha ha, but like, I'm like, <laughs> like I say it as a joke, but like, you know, just to put it out there. So I've been in meetings where I'm like, I want, I don't want, first of all, I tell because people have a hard time telling the age of uh, Asian people. And they give, they undervalue them. So I go into meetings. I'm like, I know you think I'm young, but I'm 38. (laughs) 38. Been in this industry for 15 years. I do a lot of dollars and uh, (laughs) in an all like corporate meeting. Yeah. And then I'll say like, can I get some loose? Yeah. 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 And then I was like, I want the white man budget. (laughs) Whatever budget that he's getting, I want that budget. If you want me to open a restaurant, because I don't want a a, like Asian girl budget. (laughs) And then they kind of like, but then the moment I was like, don't let me find out that budget. Because if I find out the white man budget, I want that budget. Aye, aye. Right? And so it's kind of like a joke, but like once you say it out in the air, yeah. it, it progresses through. You so know? You, want to, you want to be brutal with the way that you yourself could be viewed or sort of undersold. I already know the reality and I'm just trying to, you know. Twist. Navigate it. Okay. Twist it. Okay. And like get there. And yeah. then, you know, bring people with me. And, uh, uh, and so the challenges of what we face in 
whether it's food or or whatnot, like it makes my work fun. Mm. And so I love mentoring young girls and 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 I love, you know, integrating those into the business. And so it's interesting because I am the founder. And so, you know, a lot of companies have pillars and mission statements and vision statements mm-hmm. and and it came from me. So so I think inherently we didn't say like, oh, every year we need to do for LGBT initiatives, we just do them because it's like if someone asks me, I'm like, yeah, sure, we'll do it. Sure. And then naturally it becomes something. So, sure, sure, sure. so now that we're in the decade, of course, we hope to build, but we're still navigating because as the end is still a business. So uh, uh, right now you can see we're doing a lot of Chinese turnip cakes. Uh, that's <laughs> that's great. And, and I like finding niche categories that we can excel in and have new conversations for. Stop the podcast. Just cutting in to say if you've enjoyed this episode so far, check out thebeat.asia for more great content just like this. The Beat Asia is the fastest growing regional publication for local news, happenings, culture, and more. So be sure to check us out at thebeat.asia. Alrighty, let's get back to May. Do you think the business element uh, has brought you through the initiatives of opening up Little Bow in Bangkok, through working with Second Draft, through former uh, venue of Happy Paradise, has that been expanding your portfolio and building beyond the bow, which is limiting in a sense, building up this empire that can allow you to really build the business on a, I guess, a fiscal sense? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I, you know how they talk about, I, I literally thought about these two days ago. My industry just popped a bubble. So, you know, they have NFT bubbles, crypto bubble. And I was like, oh, I was in an mm. FMB bubble. And I didn't even know I was in the bubble. So we were growing, like, you could be an, and I was joking the other day, like, you could be an idiot in 2013 and you would break even in a restaurant initiative. Like, it, it, you would thought you were a restaurateur, right? You're like, oh, I'm doing so well. But actually, you're not. Everyone is doing well because it's a, at the height of the market. When did the bubble bust? This year. Really? So Noma, the number one restaurant in the world, just announced its closing by 2024. And because what happened was there was a huge issue that interns were not being paid to work at these restaurants. So I know all about these restaurants. Intern and full-time, 10 to 90. There's 10 full-time staff, 90 interns, 100 chefs serving a 50-seat restaurant, each working 16-hour wow. days. And so they this year, I think they offered pay, and then immediately they're like, we're closing. Because uh, I, I think it was a f- reported 50,000 US per month that they had to pay. Yeah, yeah, terms. yeah. And so that's not even that much, but then, like, because they were only Amazing. like 2,700. But what happened was in the US, and, and it started to become illegal, and you can't make people work 16 hour days and, and things like that. And so, and you have to understand, like, these, these, what happened during that time was Asia's 50 best happened, world's 50 best. So I was part of the Asia's 50 best, you know, engine. Mm. I got best female chef of Asia. 2017, yes. And that award made me do 100 interviews that year. Really? So when we're attracting, we're not attracting what Hong Kong people like. We're attracting globally that 1%. So if you think about the functions of restaurant, so if you go to Starbucks, you go because you drink coffee and they fulfill your idea of what, where you want to get coffee, period. No, ma, no one's going like, oh, I'm going to get some fermented, you know, uh, f- uh, mold tacos for lunch. Like, no one thinks that way. They're like, I'm going to the number one restaurant in the world. Sure, I'm going to bring sure, my sure, client sure. to the number one restaurant in the world. I'm going to bring, and, and no one knows what number one means, but it sounds good. So when they become number two, like one year they drop number two, 50% of their bookings canceled. So your most important goal is to get that title. Because the moment you don't get that title, you have no function in society. So there's a bit of a delish, dis- disillusionment. Yeah, so you have to know what it. you're getting for. Like, why are these people chasing these stars? Because at that point, you're not like, how do you define which fine dining restaurant to go to? It's number one, it's three Michelin stars, it's got four hats, it's da 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 da. It's all accolade based. Like, you're not going to LV to buy the bag because you actually know what craftsmanship is in there. It's because you're buying LV and your friend knows how much it is. And when you give that gift, they're like, wow, you're very generous. Do you care about these accolades? No, but I was, I, when I, I, when I won Best Female Show of Asia, I drank the Kool-Aid. I was like, oh my Mm. God. I was like, and, and all 50 was like all men. So like on that, on that uh, award ceremony, 
I'm like, careful, guys. I'm, like, I'm coming back. I'm definitely going to be in this 50. So I built Happy Paradise. I was like, I'm going to yes. like, you know, be the craziest, most adventurous, more forward thinking, which is fine with those restaurants because no one needs them as a function until you get that award. So you're basically chasing that award. So if that award takes you 10 years to get, you have to out of pocket pay for this initiative. Until you get there. Mm, interesting. So usually it's a billionaire or like somebody needs to fund this project. At that point, it's like having a horse, a yacht. <laughs> you know, like, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not like how many lunches did you sell? You know, so then you're just attracting that 1%. 300 voters, the billionaires, wow. the, the key influencers or, or things like that to put yourself in there. So, so of course I tried it. So then I think, you know, it's, it's a different game. But then people get confused, like, and chefs get confused because chefs are always a blue collar job. Now it's a fancy job, right? And to be honest, if it wasn't a fancy idea, why are these college graduates going to these blue collar jobs, right? So the blue collar job, Riz and chefs get really upset because they're like, oh, these chefs these days can't work. Like they went to Harvard. Like, of course, they don't want to spend 10 years scrubbing a pan. I mean, they could be a CEO in three years. So why are you making it so difficult? Like, think about how to scale up this operation and teach them faster. So there's this disconnect of, of, of old and new. So it's interesting. I like rode the new and I mm. rode the bubble until it burst, you know, and survived somewhat. Yeah. And so after the burst of the bubble, you want to, I wouldn't say downsize, but you want to focus on the children that you have still, still here in Hong Kong. Well, like Warren Buffett says on investment, be patient. <laughs> I have nothing to prove. I don't need to prove to you that in order to stay relevant, I have to open this year. I still think it's going to be a horrible year. Uh, we're trying to survive, and uh, we want to grow sensibly and, and in, a, in a realistic way. So to minimize my risks, because risks, when I was young, like all those franchises that you talked about, as long as someone asked me, I would do it. Really? Yeah. They're like, do you franchise? I'm like, give me 50K, I can franchise. Wow. So they gave me the money and then went to a lawyer. I'm like, can you help me <laughs> do a franchise manual? So I was quite a hustler, yes. you know. And I wanted to be brave and I wanted to feel like, you know, I was willing to be an entrepreneur and push it. But with the second draft was truly like, I wanted that location. Mm, and Thai, I, guess. I really want, I love that location. And, but Little Bao was not fit for there. And I don't know what to do with it. And... I love the bear guys, and I think they had a good idea. And so I went in, I was like, hey, can I be your food partner? And I was kind of stuck because Little Bao was not strategic at all. It just came about as like a chance and opportunity that led to like, you must open kind of vibe. So for the next restaurant, what was to follow up, I really had no clue. Mm. So I was like, oh, I need to take a break. And I'm going to do this project just to refresh myself and, and think about what's my next step. So when you opened Little Bao um, in Bangkok, was that a way to plot for more critical success? Oh, no. Uh, uh, it was I wanted to try something and I was like, Bangkok sounds cool <laughs> enough. But actually, no one would ever go. So I was like, if I fail, <laughs> who really knows? That was my first thought. Because if I if I effed up in London or New York, I'm done. Yeah. Sure. Like, because actually people know what they're doing. But I was like, Bangkok, it sounds cool. Like, oh, expanding to Bangkok, but who's checking in on me? Like, I wouldn't go to a little bow in Bangkok. <laughs> Even if Shake Shack opened in Bangkok, I wouldn't go. I would go to like a Pad Thai place or whatever. So it was for me, it was like, oh, it sounds really cool. The location is great. The partners were fun. They were in limited budget to do it. Wow. I would bring in whatever chef and designers. And I thought, wow, what a fun way to learn how to franchise. And then someone was really nice, kind to show me how to do a franchise deck. And it was a great learning curve because the moment we got there, we got to a local community. I didn't know what I knew today, but like nothing was spicy enough because you're serving not an international community. Then they're like, oh, you're Chinese food, but you're not Chinese food. No mm. one drank during dinner. Uh, in Thailand, people only drink at cocktail bars or wow. beer gardens. So this eating and drinking culture actually only exists in places like you know, L.A., like New World Cities and Hong Kong and London. And so in Taiwan and Thailand. So we, nowadays when people are like, oh, you're going to do so well in Taipei, I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so at all. Is that, are you reticent now after seven years? 
that you would want to attempt to do that again? Or does the Little Bao identity stay true to Hong Kong or can it stretch to diaspora? My new thing is that I don't, little like what right now I'm doing, I can't say what project, but I'm learning to do things in US. So I'm going to do a big project Interesting. In, in California. Uh, and then on top of that, I think for my own, I really want an iconic restaurant in Hong Kong. And in, in fact, I don't think it'll be Little Bao. I think Little Bao is amazing. It's in its own category, but there's absolutely zero function to it. I would love to have a timeless brand, whether it includes dim sum or stir fry, and then have a twist on it. But my thing is now that some of the greatest projects or things I've seen people do, they spend three to five years. Like it's like some people spend five years writing wow. a novel, yeah. a film. I was like, why can't restaurants be that way? Why don't I just spend five years perfecting every dish, every joke, every whatever inside, right? Every design detail, everything. And, and make it timeless and just do it one time only. And, and it, everything's perfect. So it's not like, oh, like three weeks to opening. Just give me a cocktail menu. We'll figure out, you know, afterwards. And so for me, I don't need it to drive any business because I feel that we're going to do retail or do a lot of things. But I really want to spend like whatever time, hypothetical five years, but, mm. but just having that timelessness to, to spend the time to have the perfect partners, perfect design, perfect everything to, to build something that's maybe worth 10, 15, 20 years. Wow. Yeah, so that's in my head. Yeah. Oh, wow. But for 2023, the plans are to... Going to U.S., US. doing a secret project. Secret project, very secret. Very secret, uh, but it's a uh, it's an amazing project, and uh, uh, I'm very excited about it. But I can't talk about it at all, but um, very excited about that. But Hong Kong-wise, Little Bao, um, retail products, uh, we're just exploring, to be honest. Okay. I think anything that needs to be good needs a 10-year effort. So I'm not pretending expert in retail, expert in anything. I'm just learning. You've got 10 years yeah. to go for that. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Now for the buzzfire round. May, we're going to ask you some quick buzzfire questions with less than a few seconds to think of an answer. Are you ready? Sure. Here we go. What is the best ingredient chefs and home cooks should start using for their own dishes? Oh, that's so hard. What? Can I have a look at these questions? <laughs> Buzzfire. That's so hard. You know what? Uh, recently, um, a vegetarian fish sauce. Vegetarian fish sauce. Mm, lots okay. of umami. Um, what's a better food to nurse a sickness? Is it American? Ginger. What? What? What's Cantonese be- Canadian cuisine. Cantonese. Of course. I knew it. If you had unlimited money in your bank account right now, uh, beyond the concepts that you want to work on, what is the next restaurant that you'd want to open? A dim sum restaurant. Nice. Modern dim sum? Uh, classic with a twist. Nice. Uh, what eateries, restaurants, bars are you visiting uh, with your wife on date night? In Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, yes. Ooh, uh, um, Mano and Ando, them two, uh, okay. open the new Rosita. casual Rosita. Yes, I yes, want to yes, try. Yes, yes. What bar after? Is it new? No, what bar? You got a pair oh, of I have or? a lot of favorite bars like uh, Diplomat. Okay. Uh, I love Lorenzo at Argo. Oh, wow. Um, do you have any specific uh, food trends that you love in Hong Kong right now? There's a new place called Both Street. I don't know. It's not a new trend, but it's a new restaurant. And it's a younger baby version of me. And I really <laughs> like it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Imitation is a trend. It's that not you imitation. Like. They're doing their own version. <laughs> but everyone told me to check it out. Really? And I oh, can okay. feel sincereness from a mile away. Oh. I think they're sincere. Beautiful. So as soon as you walk in through the door, they're like, this was coming. Now, I'm, sometimes I'm too old these days. <laughs> um, what do you still love about eating and drinking in the city when you uh, came in 2009? Well, they're still friends. Like when we go out to eat, it's, you know, it, hospitality goes both ways. I make them feel happy as much as they make me feel happy. Mm. So it's all about community. Oh, yeah. Special treatment all the way. (laughs) (laughs) She's honest about it. (laughs) Always tastes better with me. It does, it does. What's your uh, go-to or favorite restaurant these days in Hong Kong? I always go to Zhu Sheng Hong. It's the best stir-fried Cantonese Dai Pai Dong in Prince Edward. Really? It's really good. Wow. 
Oh, uh, I gotta check it out. Where is uh, 2023 taking you for travel? Well, everywhere. Portugal, US, mm, Kyoto. Nice. I'm going for a, uh, a bow tour. Oh, really? I'm gonna go to Taiwan, Kyoto, wow. uh, Xinjiang, like all these places to Xinjiang. check. Yes, yeah, so I wanna have a bow reckoning year. Oh, what are you doing with this, uh, this tour then? What's that? I wanna taste all the best bows, and I know that there's different ways to make it. There's actually a sourdough method that I'm very interested in. So I want to geek out for my own pleasure and then hopefully remake some baos here. You've got to go to Wang Hua Yes for the um, Gua Baos yeah. in uh, Taiwan. Yeah, so Super everywhere. Good. Yeah. And the lamb, the cumin lamb in Xinjiang. Yeah, oh, yes. Make me jealous. Um, what has been your most proud moment in your F&B career so far? Surviving COVID. And now we're out of it. Nearly. Almost. <laughs> almost. Almost. Um, what can the uh, industry do better for inclusion of uh, female and LGBT chefs and food makers in Hong Kong, Asia and beyond? Oh, just make it an enjoyable job for everybody. Nice. Uh, what do you miss about Canada? Toronto. Oh, I, I love my cousins and my family. Oh. They're uh, the niece, the nephews. Not the weather. So cute. The weather? Yeah. Oh, everything. It's... <laughs> It's not that entertaining there, and the weather is just okay. The family's family. Oh, the family's great. Beautiful. What is one thing that you love about eating here, but what is one thing that you'd improve on with the F&B scene? Uh, improve on F&B scene. I think uh, we need to I think we need to grow as a community as a whole. We can improve communication just on a larger scale. We've been starting since COVID. I mm. think we need to maintain it. Mm. Mm. Nice. Uh, what is the most underrated area for you in Hong Kong to eat? I really love those old areas like Hong Hom and um, mm. uh, Wan. Yes. And it's interesting. Like they're all rated 5.4.5 stars and above. And I truly believe it's not because the food is great because they're true neighborhood restaurants and people have empathy for their neighborhood restaurants. Absolutely. Whereas Causeway Bay, they're like, oh, <laughs> is it perfect though? Is it perfect for, you know, half the price that I should be paying? And then they'll give you a four star. <laughs> Ugh, we're gutless here in Hong Kong. <laughs> and um, what are you working on right now that you can, uh, you can tell our audience uh, that you want to share with your, uh, with your workings? Mm, I'm definitely doing a brand new menu because it's our 10 year anniversary. I oh, want to wow. go for a full revamp. Mm. I want to uh, myself be a little about 2023. Um, and then we're going to go into exploring how to share the bow in different formats. Beautiful. And when can people expect uh, this refresh? Refresh is actually just coming this month and oh, nice. uh, coming next month in February. Feb. Yeah. Sure. Perfect. Keep your finger on the pulse and tap follow to keep up with the Beat Asia to hear more colorful chats and rich stories. This episode is hosted by me, Ruben Verbes. Special thanks to our lovely guest, Mei Chow, for joining us today. Our producer for this episode is Marcus Trima. Our editor for this episode is Natsuki Arita. That's all for this episode. See you in the next one.